Good morning. We're in a study of the book of Romans, and for the past few weeks, we've been camped out at the very beginning of Romans 9. Romans 9 began a new section in the book of Romans, the section in which Paul is going to address this question. If Israel is God's chosen people, and if, as Paul has asserted at the end of Romans chapter 8, there is nothing that can separate a person from the love of God, then why aren't all of God's chosen people, the Israelites, saved? Why have they rejected the Messiah? Now, that's the question that we're going to actually take up in a few weeks when I get back from vacation, and I'm all rested up to take it on. But before we get to that, there's a very important verse, or actually a phrase in a verse, we need to look at this week in Romans 9.5. Many actually consider this verse, Romans 9, 5, to be the most controversial and debated verses in all of Scripture. Now, I'm just a simple man, but personally, I don't see what the big debate is all about. To me, what Paul writes is crystal clear, especially if you look at it in light of what the rest of Scripture teaches us. But even though I may not see what the big debate is about the verse, I do see the importance of the verse. There's no denying that this verse is right up there is one of the most important verses in all of scripture. Let me read it to you beginning in verse four so we get the context and the flow of what Paul's writing. Paul writes, Romans 9, 4, the word of God. They are the Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. As Paul gets ready to launch into this discussion of what's happened to God's chosen people, the Israelites, he first lays out for us all the advantages that the Israelites had simply because they were God's chosen people. As God's chosen people, Israel enjoyed blessings from God that no other people on the face of the earth had. God dealt with them in a special way. He adopted them into his family so that they enjoyed rights and privileges no other nation did. Among those rights and privileges was the fact that the very glory of God was there in their midst, in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, later in the temple. But that wasn't the only benefit that they had. God also made covenant promises with Israel that as his people, he would faithfully deal with them in a certain predictable way. God gave Israel his law so that they would know how they ought to live before him. He gave them the temple and the system of worship so that they would see that they would need a sacrifice in order to come into the presence of God. And he gave them prophets and promises and patriarchs to point Israel to the Messiah. But not only that, God also arranged all of history so that the Messiah would be born a Jew, born an Israelite. Jesus was Jewish, and that may not seem like such a big deal, but for the Son of God to become human, he had to be born and become part of some race part of some culture. And by becoming a Jew, God not only gave the Israelites a great honor, but he also made it easier for them to relate to the Messiah. He was one of their own. God gave Israel all of these tremendous blessings, but Israel squandered them, rejecting the one that all the blessings pointed to, rejecting the Messiah. Now again, We'll talk about why that happened in more detail in the coming weeks. But before we do, I really want us to just zero in on the end of verse 5 to take a look at this Messiah that Israel rejected. I believe that the argument is easily made that the second half of verse 5 is, is the focal point of all of Scripture, of all of history. That's a big claim to make, isn't it? Why would I say that? Well, 
in a minute and throughout the morning, I'll make the case for why it's true. But before I do that, I just want to touch briefly on what it is that supposedly makes this verse so controversial, so debated. And the controversy really boils down to a period. Now, I, I hesitate to do this and go down this path because I feel, feel like the path is going to take us into the weeds and and in the weeds, we may miss what's really important here for us to get. The last thing I want to do is put any of you into a pastorally induced coma by going off deep into the weeds and getting lost. But I, I think we got to at least venture partway in because there are a few translations of the Bible that translate this verse very differently than the way I just read it to you from the English Standard Version. And the different translation, well, it changes the whole meaning of the verse. Let me show you the comparison. Again, this is the way the ESV and, and actually most translations render the end of Romans 9, 5. According to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Now, the RSV renders that same verse this way. According to the flesh is the Christ, period. God who is over all, be blessed forever. Amen. Now, at first glance, that may not seem like or sound like much of a difference. The words are essentially the same. But as a friend of mine who used to live down south likes to say, it's as big as Dallas. This difference. In other words, where you put the period makes all the difference in the world, changes the meaning completely. Is Paul saying that Jesus is God over all as the ESV and most other translations say? Or is Paul really saying that Jesus is the Messiah, but God the Father is over all and the one to be praised as the RSV renders it? Why is there even this controversy to start with? Isn't the language clear? Well, here's the problem. In the original Greek that Paul wrote the book of Romans in, there was no punctuation. Now, as one who has no idea how to properly use punctuation, I kind of like that. It'd be so much easier for me to write without having to deal with punctuation. But it does pose challenges for the translators. Now, as you look at the two translations, the whole controversy simply revolves around where you put the period. But the implications of where the period goes are profound. Do you see what the big deal is? Is Paul explicitly saying that Jesus is God over all and forever to be praised? Or is Paul trying to avoid calling Jesus God at all? It all depends on whether the period's at the end of the sentence or there in the middle. The period changes the meaning of everything. So what are the arguments in favor of each view? Let me simply start by saying this. Most of the arguments are, are pretty scholarly. And since, well, you have me as your preacher, we won't be going there. I don't do very well off in the scholarly weeds. And if I start to bore myself, then we're in for a real bad time this morning. But staying at the very edge of the weeds, let me just say this. There are historical and grammatical arguments that lay heavily on the side of translating this verse the way the ESV does with the period at the end of the verse. So that it reads, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. For instance, one of the grammatical arguments would be this. In the Greek, just like in English, the relative pronoun follows the noun to which it refers. It always does that. The relative pronoun comes after the noun. In this text in the Greek, the word order is Christ, who, and God. So the who should be referring to Christ that comes before, not God that comes after to make the verse read, God who is over all, 
violates the word order of the original Greek. Now, to fix that, one could arbitrarily put a period after the relative clause. That would make it read like a doxology, like a, a hymn of praise to God. So it would read Christ who is overall, period, God be forever blessed. But that's not what Paul had in mind either, I don't think. Here's the problem with making it into a doxology. Once again, the word order is wrong. In the Bible, doxologies always begin with the word blessed. They don't end with it. In every other case where you find a doxology, a, a praise to God, it starts with blessed, like Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It begins with the word blessed. It doesn't end with it. There's also historical arguments for putting the period at the end. Throughout the centuries, almost all the ancient translation, almost all the heavyweight commentators from Augustine to Tertullian to Calvin and Luther, they put the period at the end, saying that Paul is asserting that Jesus is God over all. So what is the argument that the RSV uses to put the period in the middle? Simply put, the argument boils down to what these scholars say is a reluctance by Paul and the other New Testament writers to ever come right out and say that Jesus is God in such a bold manner as Paul would be doing here in Romans 9, 5. So their argument is if he's reluctant to do it everywhere else, then he would be reluctant to do it here as well. And he must mean something different. Now, as you look at Paul and the other New Testament writers and what they write, there's an obvious reluctance for them to point blank, come right out and say, Jesus is God. And there's good reason for that. Remember, the, the Judaism that Christianity is rooted in was monotheistic. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Not multiple gods, one God. And that's a true statement, obviously, because it's right out of the Bible. But having all of Scripture now, we come to realize this one God, this one being, exists in three persons. And I know that's hard for us to wrap our minds around, but it's the only conclusion we can come to after we look at all of Scripture. It took the early church 300 years of studying Scripture and debating it to arrive at the conclusion of the Trinitarian God that we very much take for granted today. It was a tough battle for them to get to that point. But they had to get to that point because in Scripture, it's clear that God is God. It's clear that Jesus is God. It's clear the Holy Spirit's God. And it's clear there is just one God. So a Trinitarian God is, is all it can be. But without that understanding, without explanation, simply coming out and making a proclamation that Jesus is God might be misconstrued to, to understand what Scripture is teaching that to say that, that God left heaven and became Jesus, leaving heaven devoid of his presence. Paul and the other New Testament writers, they make an effort to clearly delineate between God the Father and God the Son, but always keeping in mind there's just one God. So they often refer to Jesus as the Son of God rather than God. So what exactly is Paul trying to communicate to us here? Well, before I get to that, let's talk about why this period is such a big deal. Why it matters enough for us to spend so much time talking about it this morning. Simply put, the big deal is this. Is Jesus simply, according to the flesh, the Messiah, or is Jesus also God, who is Messiah over all? Is Jesus just human, or is he just God, or is he both God and man in two separate and distinct natures? In seminary, my church history professor once said, Old heresies never die, they just reincarnate. And I bet you never thought you would hear the word reincarnate from the pulpit here at Foothills. But there it is. What did he mean by old heresies never die, they just reincarnate? 
just simply this. The heresies of today, do you know what they are? They're repackaged ancient heresies from the early church. For the first 300 years, like I said, of the church's existence, the church wrestled with these doctrines of just who Jesus was. Was he God? Was he man? Scripture seems to present Jesus as both. But then you come to this, well, how can one being be both God and man? One of the early heresies the church had to deal with was known as docetism, which challenged the full humanity of Christ. The word docetism is a Greek word, and it, and it comes from the word dokian, which meant to seem. So according to docetism, Jesus only seemed to have a human body like ours. What he really was was a ghost or a phantom, a spirit-like thing that appeared to have a human body, but didn't really have flesh at all. This heresy actually occurred so early in the early church that John was able to address it in one of the last letters he wrote, 1 John 4, 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. But docetism wasn't the only heresy the early church had to deal with concerning Jesus. Another one was known as modalism. Modalism teaches what the early writers were trying to avoid, that God's a single person who eternally existed, but he manifests himself in three different modes or forms. It's not far from Trinitarian thought, but it's not the same either, not at all. A modalist believes that God is one person in three different modes. In the Old Testament, God manifested himself in the mode of the Father. In the New Testament, with the Incarnation, he manifested himself in the mode of the Son, and he was no longer the Father as a result of that. And then, after Jesus ascended into heaven, God made himself known through the mode of the Holy Spirit, and he was no longer either the Father or the Son, just simply the Holy Spirit. Rather than one God in three persons, it's one God appearing in three different modes, which is a Unitarian view. Of God. But think what happened at Jesus' baptism. We see all three persons of the Trinity there. The Father speaks from heaven. The Son is the one being baptized. The Spirit descends on Jesus in the form of a dove. Furthermore, after his resurrection, what did Jesus tell his disciples to do? To go and baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. New converts into Christianity were baptized into one name, God, who exists in three person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we're not done with the heresies yet. There's still another one the church had to deal with. Arius was a church leader in Alexandria, Egypt. In 313 AD, he began teaching that the Son was a created being rather than the co-equal eternal Son of God. According to Arius and his followers, as a created being, Jesus was not equal to the Father, so therefore he was not God. Now there's even more heresies than that, but we're not going to go off any deeper into the weeds. But I want you to see something here. Out of all these heresies come the cults and the false teaching that we have today. False teachings and heresies such as Unitarianism, Mormonism, and Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I'm not saying or suggesting that the translators of the RSV were heretics. I don't think that. I think they were well-intentioned. I think they were trying to use a scholarly effort to provide the best translation possible. But I think in this case, they were wrong, very wrong. And I think their wrongness opens the door for heresy to creep back in, heresies that have already been dealt with. Admittedly, all this is difficult to understand, isn't it? The Trinitary, the Trinity, excuse me, it's hard to understand. How can God exist that way, one being in three persons? How can Jesus be fully God and fully man at the same time? But here in, in other places, this is exactly what scripture wants to teach us. This really is the point 
period, exclamation point. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Look what John claims in that verse. Jesus is the son of God. He is God, but he came in the flesh. The astounding claim at the heart of the Christian faith is that the eternal son of God became human. And in a moment, I'm going to show you why without that happening, salvation would not be possible. To paraphrase a common refrain in the early church fathers, without ceasing to be what he was, he became what he was not. Jesus was God. He didn't stop being God, but he became something else. He became fully human as well. As the Nicene Creed puts it, as it responded to Arius and his heresy, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. As we look at Romans 9, 5, and we look at it in the context of all the rest of Scripture, I believe this is the point Paul's asserting. It's exactly the point he wants to make. Let me start by breaking down the clear teaching of this phrase of verse 5 phrase by phrase. And I want to do that by looking at what Paul writes in Romans 9, 5 and laying it alongside of other passages of scripture. Let's start with the humanity of Jesus. Paul makes that clear in Romans 9, 5. From their race, the Jewish race, according to the flesh is the Christ. The New Testament clearly teaches that Jesus was human. He was flesh. As Paul writes in Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus began his life just like any of us. He was born of a woman. The circumstances of his conception were obvious, obviously miraculous. He was conceived in Mary's womb without the aid of a father's genetic material, but he had to be conceived that way or he would have born, been born in sin. He would have been born with a sinful nature, just as we are. But it was undeniably a human nature, just a sinless human nature that Jesus had. Mary's child, Jesus, would share in her humanity and is in this way, truly, the offspring of Abraham, the offspring of David, Indeed, Jesus is the offspring of the first woman, Eve, the mother of all living, fulfilling the prophecy God made in Genesis 3.15 that from Eve's offspring would come one who would crush the head of Satan. Although his conception was miraculous, his birth was typically human. Luke 2.7, Mary gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. In his humanity, what do we see? We see Jesus grew and developed physically, intellectually, relationally, and spiritually, just like we do. Luke 2.40, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Living in a fallen world, Jesus voluntarily assumed all the infirmities common to our fallen humanity. He hungered, he thirsted, he grew tired, he experienced the full range of non-sinful human emotions. He wept, he felt joy, he felt sadness, he even felt anger. There are a couple of indications in the Gospels that show us that Jesus did not possess omniscience in his human mind. In, in Mark 5.30, he asks the question, who, who touched him when power went out from him as a woman laid her hands on the hem of his garment so that she would be healed? In Mark 13.32, he declared to his disciples that not even the Son of Man knows the day or the hour of his return. Jesus was also tempted just as we are Something that scripture teaches us in James 1.13 that God simply cannot be. In fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 2.18 that Jesus even suffered in his temptation. 
He not only suffered, he also died and was buried. God can't die. God's immortal, but flesh can. Because Jesus assumed humanity, assumed flesh. He's capable of suffering. He's capable of dying as part of his atoning work. As you look at all the evidence, there is no doubt concerning Paul's assertion in Romans 9, 5, that Jesus indeed was according to the flesh. But there are also places in the New Testament where Jesus is very explicitly called God, which is in perfect agreement with what Paul writes next in Romans 9, 5, according to the flesh is the Christ who is God over all. For instance, take John's gospel. We already looked at John 1, 14, but think how John's gospel begins in John 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and what the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, how do we know that that word, word, that's capitalized in that verse, refers to Jesus? Keep reading Back down to verse 14, we read before. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Clearly, John is talking about Jesus. So what is John saying in the first chapter of his account of Jesus' life? He is making the bold assertion that Jesus is God, made flesh. It's true, the verses are written very much to distinguish between God the Father and God the Son, but nevertheless, they identify Jesus as God very explicitly. God made flesh. As we keep reading in John's Gospel, we find the same thing as we come to the end and we come to Thomas's great confession about who J Jesus is. This is the climax of John's gospel. As Thomas encounters the risen Jesus and touches the wounds in his fingers, Thomas exclaims in John 20, 28, my Lord and my God. The humanity of Jesus is there. He has flesh that can be touched. But Thomas's declaration isn't that Jesus is a human, just a human. That's obvious, he has flesh. Thomas's declaration is that Jesus is his Lord and his God. Luke also makes it clear as he writes his account that we find uh, in, in Acts 20, 28. Here in Luke's account of what happened in the early church, Paul speaks to the elders of the church of Ephesus and listen to what Paul says to them in Acts 20, 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Look carefully at that last phrase. Think about what it means. Church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. The blood that was the price of our redemption is the blood of Christ. But here Paul calls it the blood of God. The only way Paul could make this identification is because he knew Christ to be God, not just merely a man. But perhaps the best example of Jesus being identified as God is found in something else Paul writes in Titus 2.13. There he writes, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here, what's Paul doing? He's writing about the second coming of Jesus, the sudden appearance of Jesus. To, to be with us forever. And as he writes this, it's clear both the words Savior and God must refer to Jesus because God the Father isn't coming down to earth. He's not the one who's going to appear suddenly. Scripture's clear it will be God the Son, Jesus, who is our great Savior and our God, who will be coming again. But think of how Jesus even spoke concerning himself. In John 10, 30, he said what? I and the Father are one. What's he saying there? If he and the Father are one, then, then Jesus is saying, I'm God. He reiterates this thinking later in John 14, verses 6 to 10. 
Jesus is talking to his disciples in the upper room before his crucifixion. And he says to them, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and still you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? Though he was clothed in flesh, Jesus knew exactly who he was. He was God. He was in the Father. The Father was in him. In fact, Jesus' claim that he was God is the very reason the Jews would use to put him to death in just a couple days. The idea of putting a period in the middle of this verse to try to keep from saying that Jesus is God, I think it distorts the very message Paul wants to give to us. Distorts what scripture clearly teaches in other places. The scriptures clearly assert to us that Jesus is fully God and he's fully man, made according to the flesh, yet God who is over all. Clearly, if there's a period to be placed in this sentence, it belongs at the end, not in the middle. But maybe instead of a period, there ought to be an exclamation point as we think about what all this means for us. There are a lot of people who think theology just simply doesn't make a difference. It doesn't matter. But you can see what happens without sound theology. You end up in heresy. And you know what heresy is? Heresy is to not really know the gospel at all. Jesus had to be fully human in order to be our representative and save us. No other creature, no other being could save us from our sin. Only the blood of a human could take away the sins of the human race. Man sinned, so man had to die for sin. Paul wrote about that back in Romans 5, verses 16 to 19. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man, Adam's trespass, Death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Only a human could die for the sins of humanity. But what human could possibly bear the weight of sin for all of humanity? Who could live the sinless life that we should have lived or die the death that we all deserve to die? Only God being made flesh could do that for us. Philippians 2, 5 and 8, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Only one who is both God and man could achieve our salvation. That's why all this matters. Listen to how a theologian named Ansel puts it. It would not have been right for the restoration of human nature, uh, of uh, yeah, human nature to be left undone. And it could not have been done unless man paid what was owing to God for sin. But the debt was so great that while man alone owed it, only God could pay it. So that same person must be both man and God. Without Jesus, who is God being made according to the flesh, we could not be saved. But Jesus not only humbled himself and died for our salvation, he also rose again and has ascended into heaven. Whereas Paul puts it here in Romans 9, 5, he is God over all, King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen to how Paul elaborates on that thought again, Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that it 
so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If Jesus is Lord, as Paul asserts he is in Philippians 2, then he is also God over all. And that includes us. Quite simply put, we are not his people if we do not submit to his rule. There's a great deal of bad, heretical thinking, a, a new heresy, if you will, that's infected the present time, the American Christian church. And that thinking is that a person can have Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord of their life. But Jesus never laid Christianity out as some kind of two-stage process where you receive him as Savior and then later on you, you receive him as Lord. In fact, Jesus' call simply was to follow me. To be a Christian is to acknowledge that Jesus is God over all who has died for you and then in grateful obedience to follow him. In fact, submitting to Christ's Lordship, I think is the true essence of faith. It's not about whether you said a prayer or raised your hand, it's about following Jesus. Are we living in submission to Jesus? Is Jesus Lord over all of our lives? Colossians 1, 15 to 18, Paul writes, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all of creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Is Christ, the God made flesh, preeminent, number one in your life? This is the question each of us must ask ourselves before we leave this room this morning. Do we understand what it means for Jesus to be preeminent? It means that everything in our life revolves around Jesus. Is Jesus our king or is there some other thing? that is our king. At the end of time, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Why? Because as Paul puts it here in Romans 9, 5, he is God over all and blessed forever. Amen. Forever blessed is just another way of saying forever to be praised. And the amen at the end of verse 5 well, it serves as a verbal exclamation point, very much mirroring what John tells us is happening throughout the ages in the book of Revelation, in the courts of heaven. Revelation 5, 12 to 13, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Is that what we're doing? That's what's happening in heaven. Acknowledging that Jesus is God over all and forever blessed. Is your life a living exclamation point to the glory of Christ, your Savior, your Lord, your King, who died for you? If he's not, then now is the time to repent. Now is the time to turn away from and renounce whatever it is in your life that you've made King rather than Jesus. Here in Romans 9, Paul is writing about the tragedy of his fellow kinsmen, his brothers, his Jewish neighbors, co-workers, family and friends who've rejected their Messiah, Jesus. However tragic the Jewish rejection of Jesus may have been, the rejection of Jesus by someone here in the room with us this morning is equally tragic. How tragic it is for a person to reject Christ, either forcefully saying, I will not have this man to rule over me, or by neglect, 
I'm busy now. Speak to me about it later some other time when I have more time. And if you're doing either one of those two things this morning, how can we who know Jesus and acknowledge him as Lord and Savior not feel the same great sorrow and unceasing anguish in our hearts for you that Paul felt for his fellow Israelites? In Christ, God is making his appeal through us. Be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And we remind you that God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for you so that in him you might become the righteousness of God. This is the gospel. I urge you to receive it, to believe it, to live in it for the glory of Christ now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Period. Double exclamation point. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. And it's easy for us to get confused about who, who Jesus is, but I pray that as we leave here this morning, there'll be no confusion. That we will recognize that Jesus is preeminent. He is number one in everything. He is according to the flesh, but he is God who is over all. And Father, I pray that our lives will be offered as a living sacrifice day in and day out to the one who loved us and gave his life for us. And I ask this in Christ's name. Amen.